There we go. How's everybody doing this afternoon? My name is Shantan Jetty, and this is Shantan Jetty Art. I'm working on a piece right now from my second art book, Shantan Jetty Art Book Two Rigor More Treks. And I hope everybody's having a great evening, or afternoon, I should say. It's not evening, which is when I usually stream, or first thing in the morning. Anybody interested in checking out the book that this piece is going to be in, it is available to check out in the link that is in the description. So the piece I'm working on right here is inspired by two things. One of them is the music video for Michael Jackson's Thriller and Rick Baker's Werecat, which you can see hanging out up there. And the other one is a Canadian horror movie called Ginger Snaps, which is a werewolf movie, um, an indie werewolf movie that won a, a quite a few awards. And uh, even outside of that, it's just a brilliant film, as awards don't always uh, mean that a film is great. But in this case, they were well-deserved. And if you've never checked out that movie, I highly recommend it. Just a great take on werewolves, really interesting. What I'm using here is Pelican Pan Opaque watercolors and a tube of white gouache. And uh, this piece is in its final stages. I've actually already signed it, um, but I wanted to put in a little bit more detail in this kind of tangled thicket that I've got here. It's part uh, underbrush, part. Um, Gosh, what are those trees called? I always forget. Bristlecone pine. I knew it would come to me. Move the camera in just a little bit so it's a little easier to see what I'm doing. There you go. I usually stream in the evening, but I've got uh, got absolutely no sleep last night, and I'll probably be passed out. I'm hoping uh, by the time the same time rolls around, and I've got my kids in the house, and my wife. Everybody's uh, always at home, but usually asleep, although less and less so with the kids. And so uh, I thought it'd be nice to stream during the day when everybody's up and about. So you may hear the occasional noise, uh, the occasional sign of life that you don't typically hear in my streams, because usually everybody's asleep. There we go. Just a lot of this is, um, the th a lot of the things that I'm doing right here is the cumulative hand control of, you know, however many years, 40 years of doing this kind of work. And I've just, lately, I've been, I haven't spent as much time on YouTube as I typically do. Last night I was watching um, Blade 2 because the outstanding YouTuber, one of my favorite YouTubers, The Choice Voice, and Michael over at The Choice Voice did um, a bunch of audio commentaries this week. Uh, and he did one for each of the Blade movies. And so I've had the pleasure of getting to listen to his commentary for Blade 1 and Blade 2. And I just hit play when he says to hit play. And uh, it was just a real blast watching uh, Blade 2 and with his commentary last night while I worked. So if you haven't checked out The Choice Voice, do check it out. It's a great YouTube channel. Also check out my buddy Arvin's YouTube channel. Uh... He's got a YouTube channel called uh, Comics Rant, and I've linked to it a few times in my previous videos. And do check that out. He takes you through his process of illustrating his latest uh, uh, comic book project, and you can get the other stuff he's doing, which is just great. I've known Arvin since I was in college. He was one of my groomsmen uh, at my wedding. And speaking of which, tomorrow is going to be my 20th anniversary. I have been married to an amazing woman for 20 years and really uh, where does the time go it's an amazing thing to know that we've been together that long and uh, she has not given up on me yet thank goodness and uh, 
Yeah. She has her desk across the uh, living room from me, and we've been working together and making art together for even longer than that. We met in college, and I think we were together for about three or four years, three and a half years, give or take, before we got married. And so, yeah, it's been two decades of uh, family life with her, and I could not be more thrilled and uh, really looking forward to celebrating with her tomorrow. And uh, But yeah, Arvin and I have known each other since college. I've actually known Arvin one year, maybe, a year and a half. Actually, I think it's just one year longer than I've known Lauren, because I met Arvin freshman year, and I met my wife sophomore year of college. Um, and uh, But he was there with me when we got married, and it's great to see him YouTubing. And we both have two kids. Uh, he's got two beautiful girls, uh, and my kids are a little bit older. I've got twins, and they are going to be 15 in October. So, yeah, the time goes by really, really fast if you're doing it right, uh, <laughs> if you're keeping yourself busy. Um, it goes by incredibly fast. Just like with this book, I can't believe how much artwork I've made. I go back and look at the files as I've got the book in layout and I'm doing some of the finishing touches, and I can't believe how much work I've made in the last two years. And it really is in large thanks to the gentleman who's writing the intro to my book, which is Cameron Scott Davis, who is a concept artist. He's worked on Guitar Hero. He's worked for DreamWorks. He's worked for video game companies. He even um, art directed me this past year, which was a real privilege. Um, he is one of my former students. I could not be more proud of him. And uh, so to have him, you know, uh, directing me on a, on a project uh, this past year was just wonderful. It's, it's one of those things... Um, I imagine it's very similar to when your kids take you for a drive in a car for the first time and you realize that they're, uh, they've are they got the wheel. And uh, wow, I've had a very long time to uh, get used to the ideas everybody in concept art and entertainment has of Cameron taking the wheel and being a rock star artist. It was really cool to uh, get to go for a ride in the car with him. It was just a blast. And really had some some fun on that project, which unfortunately, obviously, can't talk about um, because of NDAs and that kind of thing. So, let's see what else I have to do here. Putting in some darker values and trying to make sure I don't get this off of frame. So let me see if I can move that down and over. There we are. Good. There we go. A little bit more of a of a worm's eye view there get in really close on that paper and you can just see that consistency on the gouache that I use um, it's or the opaque watercolors that I use I'm going for something that's gonna slide but that's also gonna coat when I get to the detailing phase I want it to be about the consistency of ink and uh, the great thing about this paint and gouache in general is that it dries to a matte finish so you really can see when I use ink on these pages which I often do um, the one drawback of it is it's very hard to get ink that's going to be black without it leaving a kind of a sheen effect on it. And with something like this, it doesn't leave any kind of sheen. You can just see immediately as it dries. It's matte. It reproduces really well. It photographs really well. And as I've learned in the last uh, couple of years, particularly since I've been more active on YouTube lately, um, is that it films really well, too. I mean, ink can film really well, as I'm sure, but... Um, this you can really see the tones that I'm going for uh, when I'm working on it. You can sort of see all of the detail. You can see how small it is actually. Very minute detail on this thing. But it's been actually, I mean, it's been, obviously it's been a crazy summer for me as it has been I'm sure for most of you guys. But uh, on some levels um, I've had a chance to kind of be outside of my usual sphere that is, you know, uh, teaching. And I was remarking to my studio mate, who's also a uh, college professor, and we were talking about it, and uh, we were just saying how, um, you know, the rigor of that kind of work and the busyness of that kind of work, um, there's, there's a lot of aspects of it that kind of um, can take you away from, from painting and take you away from making artwork. And that's fine. Um, if, you know, one doesn't make artwork, it's probably not that big of a deal, but... Um, for those of us who do and for whom that is a major part of our lives um, this whole experience is kind of rekindled in a lot of us um, through just having the time to 
make our work. And it's for, I think that's one of the things about it that I really enjoy is that for me, um, I love talking about art. I love explaining this stuff, but um, a big part of why I'm able to do that and my, my approach to doing it is that I actually do it myself. I actually understand it. And so um, I've often found when I'm teaching that a lot of words are great, but nothing takes the place of a demo. And so I always want to do demos. And so to be able to, to show what I do in these more, these moments that, I mean, being in a classroom is great and I can paint in a classroom, but you're never going to see what it's like when I'm working in my studio space where I have everything comfortable. So the biggest trick for me is to kind of forget that the camera is here and just work. And so when I'm on YouTube, it's great. People like Michael and, and people who are in different fields, all of whom are producing uh, their own work and or championing and talking about other people's work has been really good for me. I've kind of missed it. Because when I was younger, I was an aspiring comic book artist and I would go to comic conventions. And, um, you know, that was the track that I was... I was on and, and did some work in. But the thing about it was that um, there's just a way of conversation uh, that I always encourage my students to kind of get into the habit of, of people who do it. You're, you're, less of a, you're less of a critic, you're less of a social theorist, and you're just making things and doing work. And so I've gotten a chance to really surround myself with people who are doing that um, this past summer soon to be over summer for me at least as an educator um and uh you know getting a chance to really look into certain manga that i wanted to take a look at and uh certain movies and certain independent published comic books you know and crowdfunding comics which has been really cool to look at art books as well uh there's an artist uh who i have i think i've talked about in a previous stream named uh jay uh goes by on instagram jm dragunas i hope i'm pronouncing that reasonably correctly if not feel free to reach out <laughs> and correct me on it and uh, he just came out with a kickstarter art book and um that uh, i think it, it closed recently i think but um looking forward to that and i'm just seeing a lot of artists who are finding new ways to get their stuff out there and finding ways to you know um kind of cut out the middleman for lack of a better way of putting it using YouTube, Instagram, social media um, as a means for... I don't know why that's there. Okay, I don't want to record. There we go. Let's see if that works. There we go. I had a little dot there. I wasn't exactly sure what that was for, but it's gone now. Um, but one of the things about it for me is that you can, as an artist, for one of the first times that, certainly in my lifetime, uh, you can find an audience for your work if it's quality and you can put it out there and that is just massive that is a massive change in how things used to be you can self publish your own comic book if you've got the work ethic the talent and you can put together a quality product and you start realizing really quickly um, the overhead um, how much of, of publishing and anything else is just it's a tremendous amount of overhead and there's some really skilled people who work in every field and and you you know we can all still connect as you know and, and at the same time i think people who would be uh have a harder time finding an audience because uh, back in the day they maybe didn't live in the the right area or know the right people can um get traction on their work just based on pure skill i've met so many people and have so many customers that I would have never met any other way and um, it's it's a tremendous um, gosh it's, it's a tremendous privilege to be able to um, have access to that be able to get my work out there so I'm really I'm definitely really appreciative of that and, and grateful so I'm, I'm one of the things I'm looking forward to um, bringing to the classroom when I'm teaching my students this year um, besides all of the technology and things I've been refining for how to do this, um, how to teach with this new educational model is frankly um, tied to it, which is 
that we're living in a time to where if you have a good idea and you can make great artwork, you can get it out there. There really isn't uh, anything that's stopping you that there used to be. And the main thing is just to have the skills and to make things and to have something to show. And um, I'm, I, it wasn't so much that it's the platform that's the thing that's making it happen. For me, it's the... Um, it's the fact that I've spent 40 something years trying to hone these skills and uh, it's uh, I can't I can't overstate how useful it is and the best advice I would give to any young artist watching this or anybody watching this if there's something that you want to get good at shut out everything that you can get the things that you need to get done done and then dedicate your time to improving and from learning from people who know more than you that is the only real secret and when somebody uh, find the people who know more than you, which is easier the younger you are, because when you're young, almost everybody knows more than you. Um, but find the artists and the skilled people, the crafts people, who have skills you don't have and do what they tell you to do and learn. That's it. That's how you get places. Don't uh, don't argue with somebody who is trying when you're drowning, who's trying to swim you to shore. Is my best bit of advice I could give. And uh, don't, uh, when someone throws you a life preserver, don't complain about the color. And I think that's what it is. We're all kind of, uh, you know, trying to get our footing. And, and in many instances, the, the journey for knowledge feels a little bit like you're out at sea. And, you know, when you're out at sea, it's important to know it. And it's important to, you know, grab onto the things that are going to help you survive. see if I'm on frame still. As soon as I get too into painting and I don't pay attention, which is probably a good thing. Uh, I mean, it, it's, I think the first wave of social media and social media use, and I can't really speak to it too much. I mean, I was aware of it, so it's, it's not like I've been in a cave, but it was very much about, about commentary commentary on things and things have to be produced in order for somebody to have commentary on them which is fine and by the way I'm gonna have tons of commentary on things movies I like books so there's nothing wrong with that at all but I do think this this next wave of it um, or the the full potential of it being realized is some of what's happening on Instagram which is people who are making really great stuff um, being able to have their stuff be seen and discovered by an audience and and that's turn the page here because I always try to line up my my arm with the direction of the stroke that I'm gonna make so it's a little some, sometimes I can't keep it level which is the big thing but I really do think that the next thing is not going to be about talking and having opinions on things and um, that kind of stuff as much as it's going to be just the impact of skill and so I'm meeting some really cool people um, online that I, I probably would have never heard of before social media and it's great to support their books uh, I really do enjoy it um, and if anybody's interested in supporting my book that's a nice segue um, the link is in the description to my second Indiegogo campaign it's already funded it's available in demand um, it's it's a done deal it's coming out and uh, as soon as I um, get all of the, the things ironed out with the printers and all that other stuff um, and just want to tighten up a couple more details on a few pieces just to make sure they're as good as I think that my fan base deserves. That book is going to be shipping, and I am really looking forward to holding it in my hand. That is the most fun part of the creative process. So right here, it's a really good example. You can see there's this really faint color shift. It's from a blue to an ink color, and watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this, and I'm going to put almost like a, a dark barrier of value there and suddenly it makes that blue come forward and it increases the dimensional quality of it and that is the fun part of what I'm doing that's what I love to do I mean it's all fun um, there we go I had a uh, quote I started using um, a couple of years ago at art school that always cracks me up which is um, 
I was talking to a bunch of students, and this was a couple of years ago at a different institution than the one that I'm teaching at now, but I was teaching at another institution, and uh, there was just a lot of, of campus drama and uh, such going on, and um, they were asking me, you know, not even asking me, but they were, they were you know, kind of <laughs> looking for opinions on things, and I said, you know what the crazy thing is about art school that's really cool? is that art school is the kind of place to where if you can be miserable there, you can be miserable anywhere. And uh, <laughs> everybody got silent. It's pretty. It's a pretty dark thing for me, but when you've traveled around and you've seen some tough situations and some tough scenarios, one of the things that is, uh, isn't lost on you is that uh, how lucky we are um, to be able to study art and how lucky we are to have the freedom to make our art without um, people telling us that we can't and I never uh, that's never lost on me and I think it's it's about five or six um, stages of fortunate even removed from that that if you make something good you get to profit off of your own work and you get to make artwork that um, that you can sell and improve your your uh, life with which is very cool and so I'm, I've always been um, the artists that I support and the people who inspire me, I always try to back their work, and that goes for um, everything: statues, collectibles, comics, graphic novels. I mean, I just purchased my second very large volume of the manga Ber Berserk, and and you know I'm sure I could find a PDF of it online somewhere. Or I could do something like that, but I've bought both a digital copy and a hardcover because I want to support the people who are publishing that work, making it available for me, um, and I want to support the artist. And I do think there's something to be said for voting with your wallet when it comes to, um, you know, artwork. And I am, uh, I know I say that word a lot, but I am very grateful when people vote with their wallet for my book because it makes a difference. It makes it possible for me to do this work. And uh, it makes it possible for me to have a space wherein I create it. And the more support that I get for the book, the more things I get to do um, with that work and the more I get to expand on um, what I'm creating, whether it's books or you know anything else or prints, things like that, all those things are take a certain amount of uh, financial wherewithal to do them. So that's the joy of it for me, and that's why I like to to let the artists I support, and there are tons of them, um, know that I'm a big fan. I have so many friends who are artists who I you know volunteer to do the layout for their art books if they'll come out with it because I want to see their books. Um, come out, you know, friends of mine, brothers, really, family, and these are people who are very, uh, very important to me in my life, and that, uh, whose, uh, whose success I'm, I'm ready to, uh, champion and, uh, cheer, and that's how it goes, you get to meet people that way. But then there are people who are strangers who just do amazing work that I try to support. So it's, it really does come down to the work. Let's see here. I've got that. That. I'm moving off frame again. Let's see. Where can I go? First I have to look at what's being done here, and then I have to see how it looks on the camera. Because um, sometimes I'll look at something on the paper, and by the time I turn my hand over uh, and turn my head to go look at the camera, I lose sight of where that thing is that I was just looking at. There we go. That's coming together. Just looking at all the great stuff I have. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to say but that sounds nuts. I'm just looking at all of the great things I have. But I was looking over there at all of the great artwork that uh, inspires me. And so it's the great stuff I have that makes me um, think of the artists who've meant the most to me. And uh, that's not something, that's not a space that I had before a couple of years ago. And 
I think this is the first art desk I've ever bought for myself. I've typically worked in my lap, and I don't know why I just have, have been adverse to it, but I'm not the kind of person who uh, invests in my own workspace very easily. Uh, it, it's silly, and I, it's something that uh, I'm aware of now. But I started to realize that um, you know now was the time after you know I've been teaching for 16 years and been working as an artist uh, even longer than that I did my first pro job when I was 17 um, and uh, and it was for an indie comic book publisher but it was you know back in the day in the 90s in the heyday of uh, indie comics but it just sort of dawned on me that um, you know it, I needed to have a space and, and I think probably far more than anything else having a YouTube channel or having an Instagram kind of uh, is a good reminder that you know to create time and space to work and so it's easy to get lost in in work and get lost in um, you know family and and kids and and all this stuff that that kind of makes you know all the other stuff um, have some kind of purpose and meaning to it but uh, this kind of helps me to remember that I need to have some time where I put my artwork out there and I'm committing the time to do the work And also helps that um, a lot of the teaching I'm going to be doing is going to be virtual, so um, this sort of allows me to uh, to have that setup taken care of, and then uh, bring the other stuff into it, which is the individual critiques and things like that that I do when I'm teaching, which are very thorough, much like the ones that I got when I was uh, sending out samples to. Uh, comic book companies, Marvel and DC Comics, and uh, all the editors of the past that were there in the 90s and um, late 90s, early 2000s. That was, it wasn't like it was the heyday of comics. I think it was certainly um, a stronger and healthier industry than it is today, obviously. Um, but, you know, sending my work out and, you know, it doesn't, you know, end in jobs. Sometimes if you're lucky, it just ends in, you know, it can end in a job if you're, you're, your work hits and if it doesn't it and you're still lucky you get a critique and those critiques were great they were no nonsense fix this more of this people were really letting you know what they needed and it was um it was a great way to kind of toughen yourself up as an artist to the fact that um you can't really have an a very particular type of ego when you're an artist if you want to improve early on Having an ego is all fine and good when you've improved and when you've you've earned it from uh, from your experience and from your accomplishment. But I think that um, when you're young, you really just need anybody who's not telling you what you're doing wrong in your work is kind of wasting your time. And Lord knows those editors did not uh, have any interest in wasting their own time, so they never wasted ours. It was just about basic stuff like learn perspective, learn how to do different kinds of shots, learn anatomy, and um, you know, as good as you thought you would be, you would still have a lot of critique and a lot of um, a lot of advice and a lot of suggestions coming at you, and that stuff is important. That stuff helps you improve. But I mean, I was getting rejection letters when I was eleven, so I was uh, ready for it. And I think I always sort of defined certain things like terms like making it. People say make it as an artist. Oh, did you make it as an artist? Um, I think that there's the industry aspect of that, which is really important. And it can't be denied. But I think there's another aspect of it, which is when you know how to do good work, you know how to make work and just get it done. And I think that that's what I, I would define that as being at this point. Oh, there's Seth Hart. <laughs> Very kind, Seth. Very kind. How's your work coming? I hope it's coming along good. Because you were doing some dynamite stuff. There we go. 
Yeah, I mean that's the fun that's the fun part of this is that you know, being able to put our our work out there and also some of the fun conversations that happen between artists and you know, it's uh that's what makes the space so fun. And Seth is doing some really great comic book stuff. Started really um I get a lot of students and I hope Seth won't mind me saying this, but I get a lot of artists that I work with. Excellent. Yeah, that that jump absolutely happens. But it's it's like this. It's like um what we feel comfortable with when we're young artists working isn't always that isn't the only thing that we're good at. And sometimes we get introduced to something that we were previously like, I don't know if that's my thing, if I can do it. And Seth is just a natural at color. And it was really fun to be there when he realized that. And when you got to see, you know, the, the artist that he is and his color theory emerge. And that was really cool, really cool to watch. And um, I know I wasn't thinking I was about color when I was working um, at the exact same stage. So it just goes to show these things are, are art things. And once you learn it, you can pass it on to other people. And I know that, you know, Seth is also very good at explaining color now when he talks about his work. And it's going to be great to, I'm sure he's going to be able to mentor a lot of people in color. So the whole thing gets exponential. And uh, he also uh, had the chance to go out and have dinner with my mentor when uh, he visited the great Brian Stelfreeze, who is on Instagram now, and also I believe has a YouTube channel, although he's, uh, I don't think he's particularly active on, on YouTube, but he's definitely active on Instagram. And just, I mean, Brian is just a genius, but Brian was the artist who kind of mentored me and helped me to understand color theory and drawing and all of the important stuff um, that makes up art. So let's move this camera up to where I was just a second ago because I realized that was out of frame. So let's see here. I'm gonna drop, I need to move that up even more just to put it in frame a little bit more. I'm gonna drop a shadow into this and let's zoom out just a bit. There we go. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop a shadow right in here just like I did earlier so that I can delineate the space. So I've got a bunch of very similarly dark areas. And so by putting this dark and asserting it a little bit more, what it's going to do is it's going to put that dark in front of that space. And suddenly that's coming forward into frame. And then I'm going to take this section, which is also on the left side, and all the way to its edge. I'm going to put that black value right in there. And because I've done that, you start to see that light coming back through there and that kind of dimensional quality, foreground, middle ground, and background. And the white of the page is one of those values. So here you go. And then it starts to come together. And again, these are all things that Brian Stelfreeze, my, my mentor, was just instrumental in uh, getting me to understand. I always say that uh, I wish there was such a thing as a degree from him, because <laughs> he's probably the most important part of my education was having Brian as a teacher, just an amazing guy. And then you start to see how this whole thing kind of looks in context, and that's the fun part for me. Like That's where it all sort of comes together. You know, let's see if I can tip that so I don't paint off of the frame there and there we go so all of the the parts of this you see here I just realized I got to make that go a little lower hopefully I move some things around here on my desktop my desktop's got a lot happening on it there we go now I can see right there let's see if that works so right in here at the very bottom I've got another one of those situations. Move my light too because it's having trouble reaching where I want it to go. There we go. I don't want there to be a shadow when I'm working. So I'm going to go in and just give it a nice, graceful shadow.
There we go. And then you start to get that dimensional form. And as long as you have not used black or white yet in an area, you always have room to move in terms of your value hierarchy. And so I always tell people that use them wisely, but at the same time, don't be afraid to use them. And I think most art school students and most artists, I know I was told, are told don't use black, throw out the black tube of paint, you know, mix black, all that kind of thing so you don't get too dark. And one of the things that ends up happening is with certain things like that, which I kind of think fall under the canned advice, you know, kind of category, is that you end up getting uh, people who are afraid to use black. And black is one of my absolute uh, favorite colors to use. Ivan Durrell used it. Mary Blair used it. All of these amazing artists have used it. And um, it's, it's, nothing to, uh, it's nothing to avoid. And it cannot be. There are so many different colors of black when it comes to paint, buying paint, that it can't be mixed. If it, it wouldn't exist if it was mixable. You know, I mean, you can mix a color that's like it, but you can't mix a color that would be a product of having that color mixed into it. And it's it seems so obvious and so simple, but I see so many people just avoiding using it. And it's, it's you know, always starts with some variation of my teacher said. And I'm like, well, let me be the teacher who says the opposite. Let me be the art. I always will point out really great artists who, and I'll say, well, they use black, so... Who, would you, who do you want to paint like? Uh, <laughs> it's like Ivan Durrell's a really good example. And so is Mary Blair. And uh, manga. I just can't imagine it not being in my palette. But yeah, that's what my work is. And again, my name is Shanthan Jetty, and this is Shanthan Jetty Art. This art is going to be in an art book, and the link for the art book is in the description. I always forget to say that. I don't know, some of you in the chat probably already have it ordered. Um, so hang in there. It's on its way. I'm just trying to get it perfect. <laughs> or at least close to perfect. As I can do, anyway. There we go. Someone was asking me in the last stream I did um, who my artists are that are influencing me right now. And what's interesting is um, outside of uh, manga artists, the artists who are interesting me the most are sculptors. They're concept sculptors working in 3D. And uh, Simon Lee, who is an uh, artist out of the West Coast, I believe, and uh, amazing person. Concept designed for Guillermo del Toro, um, did the uh, Pacific Rim stuff. He also did work on the Transformers films. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't, if I start listing all the things he's done, we'll be here all day. He did uh, the Godzilla, King of the Monsters stuff, all the kaiju for the legendary films. Just an amazing guy. And then another guy named Tomek, I think it's uh, Radziewicz, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And he's a sculptor as well. Does amazing gorilla work, does, you know, sculpts gorillas, creatures, zombies, Frankensteins, but they're both amazing. So sculptors have been the big thing for me lately. And I think they both have YouTube channels, although I think that um, Simon uh, Lee was interviewed on Tested not long ago, so you can find twice actually. I think he was interviewed at Monster Palooza twice, and uh, by Tested by I think it was um, both Norm uh, and somebody else interviewed him. I'm trying to think of who the other gentleman's name is, and I apologize for not knowing. It might they might have both been Norm actually, but I'm not sure. Um, Yeah, and that's another place where I get inspiration from. Adam uh, Savage is uh, tested because he has great interviews with concept artists and uh, people working in special effects. There we go. So that's starting to have a little bit more of a dimensional quality to it, and that's what I'm after. That's my um, that's my goal when I'm doing this work is to to make people feel the kind of rippling of the lines, and that's purely. That's it's. There's a, a huge aspect of my work that is from studying representational work, and it is. If you don't know how to work representationally, you know the abstraction is almost meaningless. And the thing for me about it that that kind of blows my mind 
is that there is this part though that is purely physically aesthetic too so it's not like you are trapped in realism in a lot of ways learning how to make representational artwork is about liberating yourself from it you know it's like learning how to swim to not be afraid of the water and there's not really when i meet people who no matter even if it's mary blair is a really good example um charlie harper is a really good example great illustrators are saul bass is a really great example uh saul bass who famously said his only advice to design students talking about one of the best graphic designers ever uh, is to learn how to draw and I think it's it's very much that way whereas I can always tell when I'm looking at someone working in an abstract style who's afraid of the fact that they don't know how to paint representationally and I mean making the thing look like it does you know and it, and it might not be every little detail and minutia of subsurface scattering but you have to at least know what that is and it will inform your abstraction because you got to be paring down from something and for me I'm paring down, I actually took one of my portrait paintings out on the last um, stream I did, the stream I did, I think two nights ago. Uh, and it was a painting I did of T. E. Lawrence based on um, a historical photograph of him in Damascus. And um, also uh, the, a painting that was done of him in Damascus by sort of like a news reporting uh, painter who kind of documented what was going on, you know, in full color. And, you know, when I, I showed it, I mean, it's, there's so much knowledge in that of color and skin and how light passes through skin. But if I was going to um, paint something abstract, I would just be distilling that knowledge down and I would know what I was sacrificing by working abstractly. Um, and I would know what I wasn't willing to sacrifice. Well, if you don't understand how color works and you don't understand representational work, your abstraction is really not a sacrifice or a distilling of anything. It's just a simplification. And my favorite abstract artists were just monsters when it came to understanding how light works and how form works. And a lot of them were trained in the, um, you know, the academic tradition, the French academic tradition. So, you know, we're going back in history, obviously. Um, and a lot of them were mentored. So my mentor, Brian Stelfreeze, um, I came to him with this um, comic book art style, which would be the equivalent of the most mainstream what I was influenced by would be today the equivalent would be the most mainstream comic or manga work which is very stylized very cartoony very you know whatever and he's like you have to learn how this stuff works your cartooning is just a lot of collection of other people's um, you know uh, stylistic conventions and you don't even know why they're there and it I would define the stuff that you're seeing right here as being very cartoony very cartoony and very abstract and so it's not something that I'm against by any means but um, the the any sense of the believability and the immaculate reality as Kurosawa would call it is 100% predicated on the fact that I understand how to paint and work realistically um, you just can't uh, you can't fake that knowledge and there's so much that it brings to the table so much that understanding these things brings to the table. Let's see what I've got here. Drop another dark here. And a lot of times there's, you'll see me doing a lot of things with convex and, and concave lines, although I don't ever use those terms, except for right now, so I don't know why I grabbed them. Um, but just trying to make something, you know, have lines that, that get a little sharper. If I want it to feel like something that's a tree versus an organic form, or if I want it to be a little bit creepy. You'll see me do things like that. And, uh, you know, just understanding in my head I have. And it's interesting because the terminology isn't what makes me do it. It's the picture of all the trees I've seen in my head and all the trees I've drawn and imported that data into my head. So I'm not going, oh, there needs to be a certain amount of convex or concave lines. There needs to be a certain amount of this weight here. It's um, something that becomes physical. It's almost like you're not drawing out of your head. You're tracing over an image you have in your head. And it just is happening in real time. There's no lag because it's muscle memory. There we go. Nice. Yeah, that's coming together. So this right here is where we are on this piece at this point. And I am probably going to be streaming again later tonight, even though I think I'm gonna to go to bed early. Like I'm under that I'm under that illusion 
because I only got four hours of sleep, but I'll probably be up late working. You never know. Um, but I'm going to be, uh, be wrapping up now. So give us a like, give us a subscribe. Uh, if you're in the area, um, if you haven't already check out the book, the link is in the description and I will maybe catch you guys later. And just, if you click that bell when I'm streaming, as you probably well know, it will let you know that I am and check it out. All right, guys, take care. Have a great day, and uh, I will catch you later. Peace.